How is my brain able just to receive what is an utter overload of information flying in, in all different directions, all different wavelengths, and just see everything so perfectly? And I'm sorry if you've got glasses on, but it's still amazing. <laughs> Good morning. This morning um, really follows on very, very nicely. <laughs> I'm very encouraged uh, with where we've been. But this morning, I actually wanted to start just by asking us to take a bit of a moment of reflection, really. Um, but in that moment of reflection, I wanted to have a, just a think about areas of your life that you've had some success in. Some areas where maybe things have gone well for you. Um, it might be, you know, it might be your job, it might be your financial situation, uh, it might be your family, it might be your children, you know, you might consider your family and your relationships and the way that you've built them to be a success. Uh, it might be your health, you know, you might have a good exercise regime going. <laughs> um, but this morning, you know, the more things you can think of, the better. And it doesn't mean to say that every single thing in your life or every single thing in that thing was perfect because that's not what success is you know i see lots of successful footballers missing penalties still consider them to be a success um but yeah just have a think about it and this was the challenge really how much of that which we consider to be successful how much of the good things in our lives the, the things that have gone well are because of things that we were in control of and decisions that we made and hard work that we put in um, you know whether it be study determination or routine or whatever it is how much of it is about that or how much of it is something else this morning um, i want to bring a message that basically is titled his hands on me and this is what I really feel God wants to encourage us with this morning. And we've just talked about what a blessing it is. You know, bless you uh, for this morning and, and the time of worship that we entered into as a corporate body. Um, because truly, God wants to bless us as we bless him. In, uh, in Canada, if you don't know, hockey is a big deal. <laughs> and if you play in the NHL and you're a professional hockey player, you're considered to be a success. <laughs> Um, but I, I came across this amazing statistic, um, not in research in this, just in life, watching random YouTube videos. <laughs> um, but as journalists do, they ask loads of hockey players, you know, what do you think led to your success? What do you think enabled you to get to where you are? And uh, as you'd expect, they gave all the standard responses, you know, <laughs> it was the hard work, it was the 5 a.m. starts, it was the get ups in the morning, it was the determination to succeed, it was the practice routines, it was the never giving up, all the things that you'd expect them to say. But none of them ever just said it's because they were born in the right month. And there's this incredible statistic in hockey where there's nearly twice as many hockey players to have ever played in the NHL who were born in January and February versus those born in December and November. And even now, there's 40% more players who were born in the first quarter of the year compared to 10% who were just born in the last quarter of the year, which I think is an incredible statistic. <laughs> um, but, you know, the Canadian school year starts on the 1st of January and that's where all the teams kind of follow it, a bit like we have ours in September. And, um, yeah, the ones who are first on the ice tend to be a, a year older than those of the others. And so they're bigger, they're better, they're taller, and they start their training really young. So they get more time on the ice, they get scouted earlier, they get better coaching, better experience, more game time. And before you know it, in the NHL, there's a complete statistical anomaly in terms of when people are actually born. I suppose the point is that it's not to say that none of those players had to work hard, because they still did. But it was just that none of them actually just recognized the sort of advantage and the blessing that they already had to begin with. In English cricket, I like cricket. <laughs> but I only found this out actually watching uh, Freddie Flintoff's new program where he's encouraging people to play cricket. It's quite interesting, it's good. But um, I didn't know this until I watched this, but two thirds of the current England squad come from private education. And again, you ask any England cricketer, 
you know, none of them are on telly going, oh, I'm here because I had this fantastic advantage due to my privileged background and position in life. And this isn't to pick on those guys because as I've said, they still actually had to take hold of that advantage and they still had to, you know, put the hard work in and the hard yards. Um, and we'll come on to not picking on people later because actually it's important. But it's simply just to highlight how blissfully unaware we can be sometimes of the blessings and the advantages and the gifts and the, the, the things that God has showered on us. And I just, you know, I was watching this and I was challenged by it and it was a YouTube video, I admit, and a secular one. <laughs> but, um, you know, to think about how much of my life, you know, how much of the outputs and how much of the good things that I've got are things because I put hard work in and, I, and you know, I did all the right things and I made good choices versus what, the YouTube video just put down to luck and chance. And uh, obviously, as I was sort of thinking and pondering on this, I just got this great sense of greatness and, and gratefulness towards God. And actually, you know, I entered into a time of worship as I was thinking about it at home because it just felt actually so good because it's not luck and chance. Right. It's God's blessing, it's God's favor, and his hand is well and truly on my life. Amen. And you know, this idea of, you know, where would I be if X, Y, or Z, it's, it's, it's an impossible question to answer because it's so hypothetical. It is just there to get us thinking. But, um, you know, who knows who I'd be if I was born in, say, a developing country and not Wardle. And then who knows who I'd be if I was born in London <laughs> and not Wardle. <laughs> Could be a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> You know, who knows who I'd be if I was born in August and not September. And if you want to know, September babies, statistically speaking, have higher grades than those in August. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you think like, actually, you know, if I wasn't born in September, I might not have had the advantage of getting good grades. If I didn't get good grades, I wouldn't have gone to Holy Cross College. If I didn't go to Holy Cross College, I wouldn't have ended up in the form that I ended up in, where I was just randomly selected to be in there. Then I wouldn't have ended up with the friends I ended up with at college. And if I didn't have those friends, then I wouldn't have gone on a night out with those friends who were friends of another girl who went to a different college called Sabrina. And if that hadn't happened, who knows where Teddy and Ali would be right now. <laughs> And that's really hard to imagine. But actually, just when you think about all the small things that God's in, all the little things that God has actually moved in my life, all the advantages, all the blessings, all the things, I can stand and say, truly, God's hand is on my life. And it's a fantastic thing. It's a real privilege. The good thing is for us as Christians that for many people in the world, this kind of thinking and this kind of thought process causes utter panic and anxiety. Because what it says is actually, what am I in control of? <laughs> you know, what, what is going on? <laughs> um, and it does, it causes panic and anxiety. And there's many people who have had lots of anxiety issues because they actually come to the realization that there's so many influences on their life that they're not in control of. But for us, we know different. For us, it ought to bring out pure joy because there's a God who's got his hand on me. There's a God who's got his hand on your life this morning. There's a God who's in control. I suppose one of the challenges, you know, do we know that joy in our lives, you know, that we can actually see the goodness of God just weaved throughout our entire life? You know, can we see where God is just showering us with different gifts from above? The Bible tells us that every good and perfect thing is a gift from above. Amen. Yeah. No, God wants the best for you. He wants you to succeed. He wants good and perfect things for you and your life. That doesn't mean to say that we won't face trials and tribulations. You know, we live in a fallen world. And nor does it mean that when those trials and tribulations come, that God's just taken his hand off your life and says, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's not what it means. But actually, even in the midst of difficulty, we as Christians are able to turn around and say, his hand's on me. Yeah. And there'll be people amongst us today who'll actually be like, yeah, I can see this, I agree with it, I feel it, I know it, I can tell where God 
hand is truly on my life. Well, there may be some of us who are like, I'm not so sure. <laughs> you don't know what's going on right now. <laughs> you know, how is his hand on my life even right now? You know, but this morning, hopefully, we'll get to a place where everyone can say his hand is on me. If you've got your Bibles, you turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're reading from verse 3. When I finish reading this, I'm going to go on to some Psalms and Proverbs. Don't worry about keeping up with me in terms of flicking through your Bible. <laughs> um, just listen. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, it's titled The Beatitudes. Many of you will know them quite well. It says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. I'll carry on. Psalm uh, chapter 1 verse 1 really famously says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Psalm chapter 5 verse 12 says, Bless you, uh, for you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favour as a shield. Proverbs 12 verse 2 says, A good man obtains favour from the Lord, but an evil man he condemns. Proverbs 3 verse 34 says, Towards the scorners he is scorner, scornful, but to the humble he gives favour. Proverbs 3 verse 4 says, So you'll find favour and good success in the sight of God and man. And Proverbs 8.35 says, For whoever finds me, that's God, finds life and obtains favour from the Lord. Now, hear me correctly this morning, please. Um, I am not preaching a prosperity message. <laughs> um, and, you know, this is not my intention at all. But what I do want to share is that I believe that you can choose to walk in the blessings of God. You can absolutely choose to walk in and under God's favour. Or you can choose to depart from it. You can see, as we've talked about this morning, you can choose to see the things that God has done and continues to do in your lives and in my lives. Or you can choose to focus on the things that the devil wants you to focus on. You know, the Beatitudes there, I think, are absolutely brilliant because actually half of the things that it mentions in the Beatitudes, we wouldn't necessarily consider to be great moments in our lives. <laughs> But actually, when we're with God, when we're in that right place with Christ, we find blessing and we find favour. His hand is well and truly on my life and your lives. One of the things I want to say about this is sometimes, um, and I'm really guilty of this, but we have a way of being British and very modest. <laughs> Um, and, you know, sometimes we go all quiet and we go shy about the good things in our lives. You know, and I get it because half the time we're sort of expecting, you know, us to share this great thing that's going on and we're sort of expecting someone else just to tear us down about it. <laughs> and, you know, being quiet and about blessings and success is, is okay if, I, you know, if, if I'm just going to put all the focus on me, if I'm going to say I've got this because of what I've done, you know what? Nobody actually wants to hear that, and that's fair enough. <laughs> but actually, I do not believe where God has blessed us, we should be quiet about it. You know, and I do believe that actually we need to ensure that when we're being blessed by God, when God is pouring out his goodness, when God is pouring out his, his, his greatness over us, when he's giving us gifts, when he, we can see that favour and we can see that blessing, we shouldn't go shy about it. 
Now, I was listening to different things in preparation for this morning. I came across this guy, uh, he's a pastor in America, and, and they're going on this like outing as a church, and he gets picked up by one of his congregation. It's clearly a, one of the, the, the like mega churches type things. And uh, it just so happens that this guy's got to pick his pastor up, and he does so. And it's quite obvious he's got a nice car. The pastor gets in the car and he doesn't say what kind of car it is. But immediately the guy feels a bit sheepish about it. And he goes, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry, pastor, <laughs> you know, because he must have felt, you know, he was being a bit showy and flashy. The pastor's got a good and honorable job and here he is just showing off his wealth, picking him up in this flashy car. So the, the pastor turns around to him and says, well, why, why are you sorry? He says, uh, you know, who's blessed you with this car? And the man says, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, it's God. Right then, rejoice. <laughs> you know, God has blessed you. Rejoice, give him thanks, give him glory. Now, I don't want to um, go on about, you know, things that all just relate to wealth. But I do believe it's the same with our spiritual gifts. You know, if God has blessed you with a gift this morning, and particularly spiritual gifts, don't be modest about it. Don't be shy about it. <laughs> You know, and I know I can be guilty of this, but if this is what God has blessed you with, if this is what he wants you to be doing, there's no need to apologize for the plans and the purposes that God has got for your lives. You know, we mentioned how much the hockey players and the cricket players had this great advantage that they were sort of unaware of. Um, but as I said already, it's without doubt that they still had to put in loads of hard work, loads of effort, loads of training, loads of practice and routine in order to take advantage of the advantage that they've been given. You know, they had to use it, they had to refine it, they had to work at it, and they had to hone it in. You know, sometimes even the world will recognize, you know, people and they'll say, you know, such a body has just got a God-given natural talent. And they'll recognize, you know, what advantage they've just seemingly got available to them. Um, but they still had to put the hard work in despite that to get to the level that they got to. And this brings me back to this idea of actually we can choose to walk in God's favor and God's blessing or we can choose to depart from it. You know, you might have been blessed abundantly by God, but if you don't use it, if you don't walk in it, if you don't live the life that God wants you to live, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you won't realize it to its full potential. You won't realize it to its true potential. You know, I think about, you know, some of the musical abilities and, you know, I've been playing drums and guitars for however many years, but if I don't use that at home and I don't practice it and I don't, I don't enter into time of worship at home with God, then what am I doing? <laughs> you know, if I'm not gonna use it, if I'm just gonna treat this as a Sunday morning outing, then it won't be what it is meant to be before God. You know, I believe that I've got a good brain. I think I'm smart. <laughs> Born in September. <laughs> But you know, I, I think logically, you know, and I think I'm good at being analytical. I think this is one of the things that God has given me. But if I'm not reading my Bible on a daily basis, full of the Holy Spirit, I might add, if I'm not studying it and trying to understand it, and then trying to bring that together in a word that then encourages other people in Bible studies and you guys, then what am I doing? Yeah. Being disobedient. <laughs> And so our gifts and our blessings are so much about our everyday life as what they are in just the pockets and moments of our lives. And so, you know, I want to put it to you. If you know that you've got gifts and blessings in your lives, apply them every day, you know? And sometimes you might be thinking, how can I do that? I implore you to think about it and figure it out <laughs> because it's important that actually we're doing it every day. If I just thought, you know, having a, a, a logical brain meant that I was just here to do a Sunday every six weeks or whatever the rotor is. I guarantee you, it won't be what it's meant to be. But if I put the, you know, the work in, as it were, in the week, studying, spending time with God, hopefully I'm doing exactly what God wants me to be doing. And uh, I wanted just to throw another point in, in here as well, because even I was writing this, 
you know, and I just mentioned, you know, I think I'm clever. <laughs> but as I wrote it, just naturally felt myself, as I write these, I tend to write them how I talk, but just felt myself almost saying, might not even be the smartest guy in the room. And that might be true. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I was talking about guitars and drums, I thought, well, I'll just, you know, naturally end up throwing a comment in like, oh, well, we get it wrong every now and again, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> but I actually thought like, sometimes we are guilty then again of just pulling it back a little bit, aren't we? Like, you know, actually, <laughs> you know, drawing it back. There's like this inside thing that says, you know, I'm really smart, but I just clarify that by saying I might not be the smartest guy in the room. And I think it becomes because we as humans are brilliant at comparison. You know, immediately I, I felt the need to say, I might not be the smartest guy in the room <laughs> because you might be sat there thinking, yeah, clever, but come on, didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we end up talking them down. Matthew chapter 20, um, if you've got your Bibles, you can read it. I'm not actually gonna read it, but Jesus tells a parable of a vineyard owner and uh, early in the morning, he hires workers basically to work in his vineyard. And uh, the first set of workers set off at 9 a.m. And uh, he agrees with these workers, he's gonna give them a full day's wage. It's fair, gonna pay them a full day's wage for what they do. Then 12 o'clock comes and he finds some more workers and he says, yep, yeah, I'll take you as well, get in the field, I've got lots to do. Does the same again at three o'clock, does the same again at five o'clock. Six o'clock, day's done. The workers come to him to receive their pay and he pays them all exactly the same wage. And then the guys obviously who started at nine o'clock are a bit like, hang about. <laughs> Why have I received exactly the same wage for my full day's labor as the guy who's just turned up at five o'clock and done an hour's work? And the vineyard owner quite rightly says, have I not paid you exactly what I agreed to pay you? Yes, you have. Right then, it's my money. I will delve out my money how I see fit. But it's the same thing in the kingdom of God. You know, this is a parable told by Jesus. And it's the same thing in the kingdom of God where actually there's two things that I pull from this. One is of the side of that actually God will delve out his blessings and his favor and whatever it may be, how God wants to delve it out. Ultimately, he's been fair. <laughs> He promises us that when we come to him and we put our faith in him and we believe in Christ Jesus, we believe he went to die on a cross and rose again. When we put our faith and have that relationship with him, we have a place secured in heaven. He's guaranteed us that. That is the payment, if you like, whatever you want to call it, but that is there. How he then does things after that is completely up to him. And so we shouldn't then be in a position where we're looking at other people and thinking, you know, I've done 20 years, I've been so spiritual, I've read my Bible every single day, why aren't I the one receiving whatever limelight or glory it might be? Why aren't I the one with the, with the thanks? Why haven't I got that gift in God? Um, and sometimes it's okay to ask him, but it's about our hearts and making sure that we're coming to him in the right place. But then on the, on the flip side of it, in that position I talked about before where we think there's that kind of comparison thing going and we end up just playing those giftings down that God's given us a little bit, that actually God's given me the one that's the gifting. And so if my gift is to cook for people, I'm not trying to be like Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> At the end of the day, God said, feed your people. And so I'm gonna feed the people and I'm gonna do it because I know that this is the blessing that God has given me. Talking of food, when Jesus fed the 5,000, he was out there healing the sick before he did it and he was preaching to the crowds. And uh, the disciples were with him and it was getting late. So the disciples said to him, you know, these guys are gonna need something to eat. They said, send the crowds away, Jesus, send them away. Um, because they're in a remote area, they need to get to the villages so that they can you know, get there in time, buy some food, get fed, so on and so forth. Fair enough. Jesus turns around to them and says, no, let them stay, you feed them. Yeah. And the disciples' immediate thing is, I've only got 
five loaves of bread and two fish. How, Jesus, am I going to feed 5,000 people plus their families with just this? And I'll be honest, this is probably something I might have said. <laughs> but the disciples were stood there right in front of Jesus and they didn't know the blessing and the favour that was upon their lives because of the position that they found themselves in. They couldn't see that stood right before them, telling them to go and feed them was the Son of God. Yeah. No, the one who had just been doing miracle after miracle, healing the sick. And when Jesus said to them, you feed them, they couldn't see it. And all those little blessings and moldings and shapings that we've talked about in life, all those little things that determine who we are, the way that God knitted you and I together in our mother's rooms and pieced us together, the blessings, they come together so that we might be able to serve him. And you know, how much of our lives are times when Jesus is saying to us, you feed my people, and we're like, what, how? <laughs> And you know, with the disciples, it wasn't like, you know, it was an unfair thing to do because they were just looking at the 5,000 and thinking, how are we going to feed these people? Jesus had said to them, you feed them. You know, it was a command from Jesus. And if Jesus is saying it, it comes with the authority and the knowledge that you can do it. <laughs> and so we have been utterly blessed we are immensely blessed you know i think of all the different things that have gone in my life to see the way that god has blessed me and how god has blessed you guys too you know and, and we recognize it but sometimes we go quiet and shy about it and then we don't end up putting it into practice and we don't hone the skills in the week and we don't use them in our everyday lives and when jesus turns around and says you feed them we're like what and you know, the feeding bit is, you know, we can relate that to a ministry. You know, it doesn't just have to be about food. But when Jesus says, if your ministry is about healing people and you've got a specific thing to heal people, when he says feed them, I mean, he's telling you, heal them. <laughs> For some reason, um, talked about my brain a lot this morning, but in my brain, you know, this blessing, I end up thinking about our eyesight. And uh, I am in utter awe and Andy, you'll have to tell me how I go wrong here. <laughs> but I am in utter awe at all these little blobbly bits of flesh <laughs> and that big grey ball inside is able to see in the way it does. It is absolutely phenomenal. Right now in this room, there are thousands, millions, if not billions of light photons just pinging about the place, bouncing off every imaginable surface and then some of those, as they're bouncing around, I haven't actually Googled any of this, so you'll have to check me later. <laughs> but um, as they're bouncing around at something like 300 million meters per second or something daft like that, that's firing into your eyes. <laughs> Thankfully, the photons are light enough that we just don't end up <laughs> getting peppered. But some of that light bounces into our eyes and our brain is able to interpret all of it in terms of shape, size, distance, colour, where it is, where it's coming from. It's absolutely phenomenal. And then when you think about what colour is, like all the light that's coming in is coming in in different wavelengths. Some of it's going like this really fast. Some of it's going like this much slower. Still travelling at 300 metres per second or whatever it is. But some of it's going like this, some of it's going like that. And when the light comes in, it's coming in and it's all them different wavelengths at once. And it hits this floor right here that's in front of me. That floor absorbs loads of them different wavelengths. And a few of the wavelengths get pinged back into my eyes. And my brain instantly goes, that floor's got little bits of black, little bits of white, little bits of grey, even though they're this close together. And I think, how? <laughs> how is my brain able just to receive what is an utter overload of information, flying in, in all different directions, all different wavelengths, and just see everything so perfectly? And I'm sorry if you've got glasses on, but it's still amazing. <laughs> But it's still incredible with the glasses. 
But you know, and at the same time, obviously you're seeing me and this is happening right now. It's bouncing off me and you can see all the colors I'm wearing. And at the same time, your ears are doing something incredibly the same. You know, you've got this tiny little plate and it's got frequencies just bouncing around the room and it's able to come into your ear. And when John plucks an A note, this, this is the thing that I'm incredible. An A note on Peter's keyboard, he's probably hit somewhere in the middle, it's about 440 hertz. It is four, good. Again, I've not Googled it, so. <laughs> John plucks the same A note on his bass, but his will be 110 hertz. But my brain is able to instantly go, that that's two octaves down, and obviously you don't go, oh, it's two octaves down. <laughs> but your brain, <laughs> your brain is able to go, I can hear those two sounds simultaneously in amongst the other chaos of noise that's going on and somehow know that that note is double and double and because it's double 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 it sounds really good together and if he hadn't tuned his bass in it would have been slightly off it might have been 115 hertz say your ear would have gone oh that's out of tune <laughs> how <laughs> how does it do all that while she's watching it as well and all of this happens just completely unconsciously without you even thinking about it this is just going on right now and it's just absolutely mind-blowing in the same way that God has given us eyesight and we're barely even conscious of it he's blessed us immeasurably with so many more now some of us in this room this morning will be able to share with others in real empathetic ways they can get right alongside them and they can talk to them at a level that just makes sense they understand one another now to others is given ways of interpreting the bible and the holy spirit and teaching ministries and this doesn't mean to say that none of us can't do any of the others this is just there are things in our lives that god has um, placed there especially for all those different moldings and things now some of us is given brains to be able to do things to others is given a natural ability to to hear all that musical nonsense and, and and interpret it back with your fingers you know to some he's given real backbones of strength and perseverance and they're able to endure things that other people might not be able to endure to others he's given great measures of faith to others is given the ability to serve some people don't mind cleaning <laughs> um, but you know there's all these things that God has given us and the devil may have us looking at our situations and our circumstances and saying but how Lord <laughs> how Lord how can I get out of my situation and possibly even begin to think about feeding others and I really do believe that God is saying this morning you're already blessed Amen. you're already a child of God Amen. you're already a disciple filled with the Holy Spirit, stood right next to Jesus, where Jesus is saying, go on, you do it. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Now last week, we were encouraged to allow ourselves to worship, but almost with an abandon. You know, almost that it would become an extreme worship. And this year we've been encouraged to take hold of everything that Christ has taken hold of us for. And for me, there's a real sense this year that actually God is saying, there's a release that I have prepared above and over your lives. I have blessed you. I favor you. I am with you. My hand is well and truly on your lives. Let's walk in it, church. Let's take hold of everything that Christ has got for us. Jesus is with us. He stood there right with us. We are in the most blessed position we will ever be in <laughs> other than probably eternity after that <laughs> but we are in the most blessed position as far as this world can possibly go we've got jesus right with us we've got the advocate the holy spirit and jesus is saying go on church go on you feed them you do it i'm with you and my hand is well and truly on your life amen god bless amen.